Good evening. Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum. I'm Cora Michael, Associate Curator, Curator for Exhibitions, and I'm pleased to present the second in a four-part conversation series pairing artists from the exhibition This Place with notable writers. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have photographer Stephen Shore and historian Ian Baruma with us to speak about Shore's iconic pictures of the American West and his more recent work, From Galilee to the Negev, which explores the complexity of Israel and Palestine through landscape, portraits, and street photography. Some of the themes they will touch upon include the eternal resonance of the promised land, the unique energies that seem to emerge from the landscape, as well as how the present day conflict leaves its mark on the place and its people. As a teenager, Stephen Shore was the resident photographer at Andy Warhol's factory, and in 1971, at the age of 23, he was the second living artist to have a one-man show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art after Alfred Stieglitz. In the 1970s and 1980s, Shore pioneered the use of color photography as an art form. On road trips across the country, he captured the banality and beauty of everyday America, chronicled in his collections, American Surfaces and Uncommon Places. As Lynn Tillman wrote, these works are about the importance, the fascination, and the beauty of ordinariness. Shore teaches photography at Bard College, where he is program director and Susan Weber professor in the arts at the photography program. He is one of 12 international artists whose photographs of Israel and the West Bank are featured in the exhibition This Place, on view here until June 5th. Ian Baruma is a renowned journalist and historian who writes on a broad range of cultural and political subjects. Educated in Holland and Japan, he studied Japanese film and Chinese literature, and the art and culture of Asia remains one of his primary areas of scholarly expertise. Among his many publications are Murder in Amsterdam, The Death of Theo Van Gogh and the Limits of Tolerance, from 2006, which won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for the Best Current Interest Book, and Year Zero, A History of 1945, published in 2013. In 2008, Baruma was awarded the Erasmus Prize, which is awarded to an individual who has made an especially important contribution to culture, society, or social science in Europe. He has also written numerous articles and essays about Israel and Palestine for the New York Review of Books and other publications. His most recent book, My Promised Land, My Grandparents in Love and War, was published just last month by Penguin Books. He and Shore are colleagues at Bard, though I hear they don't know each other terribly well, um, where Baruma also teaches as Henry R. Luce Professor of Democracy, Human Rights, and Journalism. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Shore and Ian Baruma. Um, well, I'll kick off with a question. It seems a long way from Andy Warhol's <laughs> factory to the desert of Hebron. Yes. Um, and you've often spoken about the different phases of your photographic career in terms of, of finding pro new problems to solve. Um, what were the artistic and perhaps non-artistic problems that you felt you were facing photographing uh, Israel and Palestine? Uh, there, there were a series of them. One of them was, um, was a technical one, that sometimes if I need to revitalize my thinking, uh, a, a new camera will do it. And uh, the, the work that's in the show here was all taken with an 8x10 view camera, which is a camera I'd been using uh, regularly since, since the early 1970s. But in, I'm going to show some pictures. Uh, can we get the slideshow going? Um, and some of the work you'll see, like this, is done with an eight by ten, but some is done with uh, are done with a uh, a very high end digital camera, and it offered an opportunity that uh, that I'd actually been looking for for probably forty years, which is a small handheld camera that can take a picture with the same resolution as uh, a 4x5 view camera. Uh, so I can have the detail and the uh, tonality that I would expect from a large format camera, but have the spontaneity 
and mobility of a small camera. So that opened doors and it allowed me to take pictures that I simply couldn't have taken before. But I think the more serious questions, um, I've tended up till now to photograph, with a few exceptions in, in North America, uh, not in politically charged areas. And this presented a situation where there was clearly a political charge. The, I had to deal with how, uh, to what extent do I show it? To what, and, and what is the scope that I want to cover? Um, so the challenge, the, the real the aesthetic problem was one of content. And how do I make sense of this large, complex place? I think being part of this project was, um, was in, in a way a godsend because, because there were 11 other photographers, I didn't feel like I had to make a summation that, that I knew other people were doing other work and that would all be in a show and, and fit into a, a complex whole. Um, and that took a certain kind of pressure off. But I wanted to show, you know, when I read about Israel on the West Bank in the paper, it's always about the conflict. But for people who live there, their life is, is a lot more than that. And um, their life involves the conflict, but, but uh, it's also life. And I wanted to show that. I wanted to show the land, and I wanted to show uh, uh, what, what average life is like. And that, and that sort of became my aim, and that was the, the problem for me. Yes. D it, w did that force you into a kind of departure from something that's characterized your work, I think, in that you once said uh, about um, uh, Robert Frank, who did the famous book, The Americans, that um, perhaps in contrast to somebody who I think influenced you a lot, Ansel Adams, that Frank had a kind of biting, almost satirical look at America, which you called, I think, in an interview, a, a sort of a critical stance. It was, you might describe it as a sort of horrified fascination even. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Ansel Adams and, and a lot of your own work tends to be much cooler and Takes Walker, things as Walker they are. Evans, I think. I'm sorry. You may be thinking of Warhol-esque. Wal Wal I mean, yeah. it's not a horrified fascination. Yeah. It's simply sort of photographing what's there. Mm -hmm. Did a politically charged place like Israel cha change that attitude to photography? I found not, and I think maybe that's why I wanted to put the pictures of of. Uh, of places where the, the, the political situation was more evident in, into a larger context. Because I didn't want it to be just about, I mean, I could, uh, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about, and you'll see a series of pictures uh, that I'll be showing in a little while, of, of Hebron. Um, you know, you can describe a political situation in words, and, and make it clear, maybe not deal with the whole complexity in a few sentences, but make it clear in a few sentences. And, but you can't photograph that. And so you can only photograph where, where things become visibly manifest. And for me, that place was Hebron, where the, the conflict really uh, became visible to, to an observer, you, and you could see the tension was, was there in physical form. But it, it seemed important to me not to just concentrate on that, that it's a small part of a, of a larger whole, which is that it's a small part of a larger life. Yes, I can see that. On the other hand, in a place like Israel, almost everything is politically charged. Uh, for example, you've taken pictures that you, you, you were just telling me as we were chatting on the way in, that your first trip to Israel uh, you went there because you were interested in archaeology. Yeah. And you took photographs of archaeological sites and shards and pots and that kind of thing, which seemed to be completely uh, unpolitical. I mean, there's nothing political about it, it seems. On the other hand, it's also true that uh, Moshe Dayan and uh, 
the other general, um, uh, Igdal, uh, yeah, I've written it down, yeah. sorry? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, that they were both very keen archaeologists, partly because they were interested in arche archaeology, but there was a political agenda, which was mm -hmm. to sort of let, stake a claim on uh, the Jewish, or the Jewish claim on, on the soil. And so even that isn't really completely unpolitical. No, there, there were a number of levels of politici mm -hmm. politicization of the archaeological digs. For example, in, in the book, I, I have edited out one picture, which is of human remains, because I know that if I published it, it would get the dig in trouble, because, because there are groups who would close them down. The ultra-orthodox. Yes. Um, also, I know that on one of the digs I was on, there was a, a, really a subtext of, of wanting to find uh, archaeological proof of, of, the, the, of the Torah um, and, the other, and the other books of, of the Old Testament, and, and that this was on the minds of, of the ar archaeologists. So how can one, on the one hand, <coughs> photograph scenes that, that are charged and without um, sort of necessarily commenting politically on it, but how, how do you visualize it? For example, the landscape itself. Do you, a lot of your photographs, for, I'm thinking, for example, the, the pictures, you, the very beautiful pictures you took in Scotland. And it seems like a landscape that is almost prim primeval, that's not touched by man. Of course, all landscape, uh, most, or almost all landscape in the world has been touched by man in one way or another. But it seems that you don't see the footprint of, of man, and yet... But you see the footprint of lamb. Of lamb, certainly, <laughs> and, and of history. And I wonder how, how one visualizes that. For example, and I, I don't want to draw any uh, comparisons um, historically at all between what I'm about to say and, and the pictures of the West Bank. But I remember traveling in a train through the forests in Poland on the way to Lublin, where there was a very horrible death camp. And you know that all kinds of terrible things happened in, in that landscape, or in Lithuania for the same mm -hmm. thing. And you sort of have to resist the notion that the landscape itself is guilty. Now, does that come into your attitude when you photograph a landscape, and the, 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 the presence of history? As you're saying that, um, I think not so much in this project as the next project I did um, was in Ukraine. And I felt that completely. And I made a couple of trips there, and the second trip, I, I wondered before I left, am I going to feel this again? And it felt like there was this emotion hanging over the land. And I can't separate it from the, my knowledge that my paternal grandfather emigrated from there, that I, before I went, ever went there, I had read Thomas Snyder and knew that the history of, of the, I mean, the extraordinarily tragic history of, of that country. Uh, I can't separate all that from it, but I, I'm convinced that it was just like something in the air in Ukraine. And do you think it comes out in the, it, it, it's something that somehow comes out in photographs or in, in the way yes. one visualizes these? In, in, how I'm, would you describe it? Um, Photography is, I think, surprisingly adept at communicating psychological and emotional states of the photographer. If, if someone has put in years of practice and has, has some degree of mastery of the medium, um, it, it, it uh, seems to be able to communicate it. And that's, as we were talking about the problems of content in, in Israel, I had to face it even more so when I was working in Ukraine because uh, the work was centered around photographing Holocaust survivors and their homes and the villages they were lived in, they lived in. And, and I went in knowing that I'm, I'm doing something that contains 
a red flag, that there's this cultural charge, and I say the word Holocaust, and immediately fireworks go off. And, and I'm, I don't want to take pictures that are manipulative and that play on that. I don't want to be a Holocaust tourist. Uh, so I just trust that to take clean, direct pictures and that I ju I'm just trusting that somehow that, that, that cloud of emotion that I felt every single day that I was in Ukraine somehow is going to find its way into the pictures. Yes. No, I, and, and, and I can imagine yeah. it being the same in Poland, that, that there's something about maybe that part of Eastern Europe. And it is, of course, in our minds, isn't it? Because famously, nature is indifferent to the terrible things that people do. And I mean, while people are being murdered in death camps, the birds were chirping away and, 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 and so yeah. on. So it, it is in the mind. Yeah. And so it's, yeah. it's very interesting what you say, so that the, what's in the mind of the photographer somehow translates even in a photograph, which is a, a, a reproduction, well, it's a kind of reproduction of, of, of reality. Yeah. And, and it's, not, it, it's not hard to see why that's the case, that the decisions I make as a photographer are, are based on what I'm paying attention to. And so something very simple, that if, if um, I'm in a state of mind where, where I'm seeing, my mind is quiet and I'm seeing things with greater vividness, the, I will choose intuitively to photograph from a slightly different angle because I'm aware of the light and that I'm, I would gravitate to uh, an angle where the light will communicate a greater sense of vividness. Uh, and that, that's, that's on a, I'm not even talking about an emotional level, just what I would gravitate to to photograph is going to communicate it. Mm -hmm. What else I include in the picture, how close I am. Little things like slight variation in distance changes the 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 emotional tenor, uh, the the savor of a picture. And um, again, I I don't think one has to set out with that as a name, but that again, if with years of practice, um, when the if when the medium becomes second nature, I feel a photographer can trust that that will come through. Do you think, in, in, in a sense, I, also perhaps your approach, your, your sort of distant and, and, and dispassionate almost approach, can actually make um, the political sense even more dramatic or even, even sharper? And I'm thinking, for example, of one of the pictures in the exhibition, which is a sort of panoramic view or a view from above of Hebron. And you, and if you, look, if you don't look carefully, it just looks like a, a very rather nice picture of a, a, a Middle Eastern city. And the, but if actually, you, this is another view of, of a street level view yes, of that same that's, place. That's right. But if you look carefully, yeah. you see uh, a, a, a wall, you see barbed wire, yes. you see um, a, a place where the military would be there with guns. Yes. But it's almost as though it's a banal scene. Mm -hmm. It almost makes that seem as normal as all the houses around it, where, of course, it's not at all normal. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a scene that's it's utterly abnormal, and yet the, the, the fact that it's shown in the same way that perhaps you show in other pictures of the United States, of a freeway somewhere mm -hmm. in, in, in Texas with a, with a Texaco sign or something, uh, makes it even chillier in a way. Mm -hmm. Is yes, that I something that, that you, you feel yourself? Yes, and, and I think another side of that is that I find that if I feel that someone is trying to manipulate me, I back off immediately, like I close down inside, kind of protect myself from it. Uh, and so it's the work that is that is, seems striving less, that may be the more powerful, at least for, for me as, as, a, uh, as a viewer. And were the pictures that you took of Hebron almost all done from the Arab side no, they, of the they city? No, they were done from uh, the uh, Israeli settlement uh -huh. side. 
So uh, you see the Arab parts, but, yes. but across the wall, as it were. Yes. And was that deliberate or...? or um, the first time I went to Hebron, I, I in fact, spent most of the time in the Arab part and, and have one small group of pictures in the book um, from that. But um, it, it, when you're in it, it's not that different from other Arab cities, other West Bank cities. What, was, what seemed particularly striking was that, that, as I mentioned, this was the place where I could take a picture like the one you're describing, uh, and y you can begin to read the picture and see, literally see the, the tension of, of the conflict ma made visible. And so it was from that side where it was, uh, it seemed clearest. Can you also perhaps speak a little bit about something you mentioned already, but a bit, uh, elaborate a bit on the, the, the very peculiar light uh, that I myself also saw on, on the West Bank, and especially in that, the landscape around Hebron, yeah. um, and, and compare it to the light that you get in, say, the southwest of the United States, which has a, a somewhat similar landscape, mm -hmm. although obviously not the same. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I'm not sure you can even separate the, the light from the landscape. And I found the landscape, particularly in the West Bank and Galilee, extraordinarily powerful. Um, there, it was, I, I found myself deeply attracted to the land, that there was something that felt special about it uh, in, in lots of different places there. Um, but I'll tell you a story about the light. Um, so I worked over about a, maybe a four or five year period. I made six trips. And uh, the other photographers did the same and we would, we would share assistants. And the assistant I used also worked with, with Thomas Strut. And on my second or third trip, he said something funny I noticed that if you, speaking to me, I'm photographing in the desert and there's a, one little stray cloud that's covering the sun, he said, I've noticed you'll just stand there and wait for the cloud to pass. And he said, Strut was the exact opposite, that he would set up, and then of course this is a desert country, and, and he would wait for however long it takes for a cloud to come and cover, and cover the sun. And I said, well, it's simple. He, he grew up in Northern Europe and I grew up in, in the States, and I figured out how to photograph in bright sunlight, and he learned how to photograph in overcast. Yes, on the, you could turn that round, though. That it, it, it's also possible to think that um, to a European, bright sunlight, or a northern European, would be more exotic and therefore more appealing. And we were talking earlier on, on the Ameri about the American landscape, yeah. and um, I remember the only time, and I've lived in Japan and I've traveled all over Asia and so on, and the only time I've ever felt culture shock in my life was when I saw for the first time when I was 19, I saw Los Angeles. And I'd seen it in the movies, but it was a city like no other I'd ever seen in my life. It, it was so peculiar and strange. I liked it, but it was really odd. And you were telling me that you, as a New Yorker, you had it was almost as exotic to you, the, the, yes, the world we, of America. Yeah, we were, we were talking before, um, uh, while we were waiting to come up here, uh, about that we had similar experiences reading uh, Nabokov's uh, description of, of Humbert Humbert's trip across America and, America, and the song uh, Route 66. Route 66. On Route 66 the, 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 the almost incantational quality of the names of the cities and how they were magical. And they were magical for Ian growing up in the Netherlands and magical for me growing up in New York and, and probably equally exotic. Yes, and very utterly misleading because to us, uh, the name Memphis 
was almost as sort of exotic as the real Memphis, uh, whereas it's in fact probably a rather dreary city. But, um, and if you look at your photographs, you do, I think maybe because you are, that's the difference between being an American photographer and a European one, to come back to Robert Frank. The, the European tendency is to play up the satirical side of, of the American landscape, to make it look weirder than it actually e even is, and, f and more absurd and surreal and so on. Whereas it seems to me you did the opposite. You, you de-exoticized it in some ways. It, it, w w how aware were you when you did that of this? I find them basically fascinated by the way things are. Um, you know, I, 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 my current project, my project for the past almost two years, is posting every day on Instagram. I mean, it's devolved from high art to that. Now. Mm -hmm. um, and occasionally I take pictures of, of skies, and today I posted a very dramatic sky. But I'm also looking through, and I have pictures of just very ordinary clouds, and I, and I, which I'll occasionally post. And I'll think, when I'm doing it, I'm thinking, why is there a prohibition against ordinary skies. Why do clouds have to be dramatic? And I think it's symbolic of, of an approach I have a, about a lot of things. And um, we were talking earlier also, you mentioned the, the work I had done in the northern Italian village of Lutsara. And when I was there, it was exactly to the month, 40 years after Paul Strand had photographed the same village for his book, Un Paese. Uh, not that I was meant to do a rephotographic survey of, of his book, but it was just almost, it was really a coincidence that it was exactly 40 years. Uh, and an Italian photo historian named Paolo Constantini sent me a copy of a letter that Strand had written while he was in Luzzara, and he said, it's so difficult to photograph here because there are no buildings of architectural interest. And it's those, it really struck me how different the words architectural interest were for him than they are for me. And for him, it meant a building designed by a noted architect or that communicated the humanity of a peasant. And for me, architectural interest refers back in a way to what I was saying about the conflict, that as a photographer, I'm limited to how cultural forces show themselves visibly that are accessible to a camera. And one of the ways cultural forces show themselves is in architecture. And so I find the most average architecture fascinating because I see in it this bubbling up of these cultural forces. And this is where I can deal with it as, an, as a photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't have to be the work of a great architect and it's not that I'm being ironic about it, because this is, it's simply, this is where it's made manifest. No, in fact, it's unironic. And uh, I was thinking also when I was looking at some pictures that you did on trips through America of things like the breakfast you'd had, and you see a table with leftovers of a, a scrambled egg. Yeah. And it's very, very different from, say, the pictures taken by somebody like Martin Parr, mm -hmm. who's done a whole book, I think, on fast food and people eating fast food and so on. And in his photographs, not only is the irony very thick, but they're almost all made to look grotesque. Mm -hmm. Whereas your leftover scrambled eggs look like leftover scrambled eggs. Yes. And yes. Th that which is clearly very, clearly intentional. Yes. But yes. I could see how in the 60s and 70s, and so when you, uh, you, you began to photograph in this way, this was I'm a real... I'm sorry, I'm smiling because I'm thinking of something that I, I'm trying to think, should I say it? Yes, say or it. Or shouldn't I say it? No, no, you should say it. There's a photographer in the show, in, in the show that's up here now, named Fuzzle Sheikh, who's, who's a, a friend of mine and a wonderful photographer. And we were both in a show at the Tate Modern called Cruel and Tender. It was the first photography it. show that the Tate had. And the joke among the photographers was that Fuzzle wasn't cruel and Martin wasn't tender. 
<laughs> which is essentially what you're saying. Yes. No, that is what I'm saying. But, uh, but the, 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 the Warhol-esque sort of almost celebration of the ordinary was a real artistic statement at one point. I mean, nobody had quite done that, done that before. How does this change and how does the whole, I know this is a very big question, but how does the role of the, the sort of art photographer change or has, how has it already changed in the world of Instagram when everybody is a photographer and most people are not good enough not to take pictures that are banal. So where is the, where do, do, how does that affect the kind of work that you've done? That's a, a fascinating question. Um, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about Instagram. And do you remember SX-70s? No. It was, a, it was a Polaroid camera about 40 years ago. And it, it produced prints that are about this big. And there were certain, uh, Walker Evans spent some time toward the end of his life using SX-70. And there was something about the process that allowed for kind of quick notations, like I'm looking at the way the air bubbles are in this glass, and that's good enough for a little SX-70. And I wouldn't take out my 8x10 and do it. It's not complex enough for it. But it's a little notation. And Instagram does much the same thing. Uh, and, and for me, that's, that's part of the joy of Instagram. Mm. Um, you know... Yeah, everyone is a photographer now, but for years, everyone was a writer. Not quite everyone. Well, everyone wrote. Yes, that's true. But not everyone was As, a was, good writer. Was a good writer. <laughs> no, but... And so now photography is in the same boat that writing is in. It's now a, it's, it's a skill that has become universal where... 30 years ago or 40 years ago, it wasn't universal. But writing has been universal, at least in Western culture, for a very long time. No, that is absolutely true. But, but um, it, it's clearly the case that um, not every uh, Instagram uh, photographer is going to come up with pictures like Cartier-Bresson. I mean, absolutely it, it, impossible. Right. And, um, in some ways, it seems, maybe I'm completely wrong about this, and please tell me if I am, but looking at your work, it seems to me it's, your work is less about catching the fleeting moment, which, the, which was, was uh, Cartier-Bresson, it's the fleeting scene yeah. almost. And, and you say somewhere that you knew how to be a really good photographer. You, you, you had the technique, you, you knew you were good in the way that most people are not. And then you almost deliberately took pictures like the, the, that wonderful series of, of, of postcards of very banal things like banks in Texas and so on. And uh, it, it's very deceptive because it look, they, they almost look like, the, 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 like real postcards like that, which also exist. You, you, you used to ha hotels they, used to hand them they, out. They are real postcards. Yeah, they are real postcards. So, <laughs> The, the, what is fascinating there is, is that very subtle borderline because between an artistic expression of something and something that is, let's, let's call it naive. Uh -huh. or, or, and you did it because you knew you had the skill, but you did something very strange, peculiar at the time with it. Mm -hmm. Now, that must change, or, or, or one's perception of that approach to photography must change when everybody can do Mm -hmm. Something that looks like that, even if it you're isn't right. quite the same. You're right. I hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. Um, and so for myself, th there are certain Instagram cliches that have developed, and I will either avoid them or take pictures that intentionally play on them. Um, Could it mean a, a, a but, return? Uh, okay, yeah. But something else I want to add. Um, that's even sillier than Instagram, and it's, it is a camera called a cat cam. And if, I, I suggest anyone go home and Google the phrase cat cam. And you'll, there's, it's a, a very lightweight German camera that goes onto an, a pet's collar. 
and can be set to take pictures at intervals, like one every minute or every two minutes. And some of the pictures are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and when I first saw it, it was, it was really depressing, actually. <laughs> Because I, you know, I've devoted 30 years of my life to teaching, and I, and I think, okay, after four years, if these students that I've been teaching can't take a, a better picture than a, essentially a random photograph, <laughs> what, what does it all mean? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> and, and, uh, but we've always known that, that, that if you give a, a, a camera to a monkey, um, it's perfectly possible that they'll come up with at least one really arresting image. Yes. What is difficult is for the same monkey to repeat arresting images. I mean, the, the, and for that, you do have to be a photographer with a mind, with a, with a brain, and who, who can yes. actually do the stuff. Yes, I, I, I agree, yes. <laughs> Nonetheless, it, I mean, do you think... But it, it gave me pause for a little while, and then, but I realized <laughs> exactly what you were saying, and... Uh, but do you think it could mean for, for uh, people who practice photography as an art form that it could move back to doing things that are technically too difficult for most amateurs so that well, they can the distinguish? Is, it, that it raises, some, what you're saying raises something which is partially behind the cat cam, which is that um, to, and I mentioned writing before, but to be able to write, I, as I'm saying it, I understand there are some people who are illiterate, not that many in our culture, but it is a skill that has to be learned, uh, simply how to, how to write mm -hmm. and read. Uh, taking a picture is easier, and uh, especially with cameras that are autofocus, auto exposure, in every, every formal sense, it is a complete picture. I mean. A monkey, or in this case, a cat, can take a picture that in any formal sense is complete. It has, it has edges, it has a plane of focus, it has content, it's well exposed, it, it's in focus. Um, it's, it's the easiest medium to create something. Mm -hmm. So there's never been that high a technical barrier, and even before the automatic camera, it really is so easy to learn compared to a skill like reading. Um, so it's always been something else. It's always been the mind and, and mm -hmm. how you see. And I think what attracted me or struck me about the cat cam is that it's a picture made without any presence of visual convention. And that's what, as artists, one of the things we have to struggle with is how do we polish ourselves and scour the, those conventions out of ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. To see the world more clearly and immediately. And immediately meaning without mediation. Yes, and, and, and I think that, well, there's, there's one other way in which you can compare it to writing, which is that not every great writer was a really good writer, as it were. I mean, you can be a, 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 a very average stylist but have something to say about yourself and life and so on that is so interesting that it doesn't really matter. And you have great stylists who can write beautiful sentences and so on who don't have all that much to say. And I suppose the same is true of photography. That, that, that There are a lot of photographers, especially now, um, who, some of whom I don't particularly like, but who uh, are popular not because of the technical quality of their pictures, which are often, often deliberately badly photographed, Wolfgang Tillmann, so it seems to me, is an example, but who people like because it uh, he has something to say about his life. It's a chronicle of a, an attitude of a life and, and so on. And for that, I suppose, uh, I mean, that, that can be an art form in itself. W would, you, yes. would you put yourself, or at least part of your work, in that camp, and that, that you were, were at certain fa phases of your career interested primarily in, in photography as a sort of a, a chronicle of the life you were living at the time? Uh, yes, uh, especially the series uh, uh, American Surfaces. It was essentially a visual diary. Uh, it was very much that. And 
there have been times during my Instagram work that that it becomes a, a somewhat more autobiographical, and then I'll kind of move away and make it less so. But the, but there are periods where I'll take lots of pictures that are that are very personal. Do you think that's a matter of age, that um, young artists, I mean, famously, the first novel tends to be autobiographical, but that young artists are more interested in, um, in, in, in chronicling their life than when you get older and you, then you go on to other things? Or do you think that's entirely a pers individual thing and has I, nothing I to do with in, age? I, I think it was individual. Where are you now in that sense? Um, I kind of waver in between. And so, the, again, really all I've been doing recently is Instagram. And so, as I look at it, I see that um, I'm taking some pictures that are the notational pictures. I'm taking some that are, I think, as complex as my 8x10 work. I uh, take some that are very personal and are just kind of diaristic. Uh, Three days ago, I took a picture of my wife having a nap with our cat. And it's very unironic, very personal, very sweet image. Mm. Uh, today, I posted a, a sky, a ver kind of slightly dramatic sky picture, but it's nothing I would have ever photographed with a larger camera. Uh, sky pictures are kind of cliche, and you can get away with it on Instagram, but I wouldn't have. How is that related to the way photographs are displayed? For example, if you, you take a, a picture with a large format camera of an Israeli landscape, that obviously looks very good on a museum wall. Yes. It's wonderful here. Uh, do you think that photographs will be displayed and distributed in a completely different way with digital media and Instagram and so on? Or, or do you think those Instagram pictures could be made to look good on the museum wall as well? I think some could, but um, I think the people who tend to use Instagram the best visually are thinking about what a picture looks like about two by two or three by three inches. And so are photographing in a way that, that looks good on a phone or on uh, largest on an iPad. Uh, and that's very different from what, you know, in the show here there's a, a Jeff Wall that is like the size of that, almost mm -hmm. the size of that image. Um, yeah, the question. And, and so, yeah. you, so there are different things that you would, different approaches you would take, knowing yeah. that this is the size it's going to be. Also, uh, it's a, a rear projection uh, screen, and different things look work on that than would work on a print. So it's by, um, you're seeing it by transmitted light rather than reflected light. And so the, the physical quality of the image on a phone is part of what, uh, at least I'm taking into account, and, and I think a, a lot of the people who are using Instagram as a medium are taking into account. How can photographers um in, in our age make a living in, in, in the sense that it used to be that photographers could make a living by taking pictures for magazines, um, annual reports, books. Then it moved into the art world and some photographers made huge amounts of money creating works of art for museums and collectors and so on. The, the, the photography of the Instagram, uh, is this I have no idea. This is going to be very I mean, difficult. I, I, I did a small book, but I mean, I didn't get anything for the book, and I don't know why anyone would buy it. If they want to see my Instagram pictures, they just, the feed is public. Um, but I, it's, I mean, I, I, it's not just a question of a photography, of photographers, of course, but uh, let me get back to Israel a little yes. bit, uh, and, and the role that um, your own life plays in your work and so on. Did Israel ever mean anything special to you? Were you, uh, as a boy, made to pay your pocket money for trees to be planted in the Holy Land? Or was it something that left you fairly indifferent? What was your, what uh, role did it play? It, it played very little role. I, I, had, I had an uncle for whom it was 
uh, important, and so I heard things from him about it, but um, not much role. And when I first went there on the archaeological digs, um, I was just struck by the tension and the anger. And I don't mean between Palestinians and Israelis. I mean between ultra-Orthodox and reform. And I mean, uh, I was staying outside of Tzfat and in a, at, at a, for the hot sword dig and at a, at a guest house that all the people on the dig were in. And uh, an ultra-Orthodox man came up to me and, and was almost hitting me that I would live under the same roof as a Gentile. Um, you know, I saw fights break out in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre between v religious people of two different Christian denominations. Uh, it, it was it, the, the first day I was there. I arrived on a, a Friday morning, and the next day, um, cars were being stoned, who were breaking the Sabbath, driving through Meir Sharim, right, which is an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. Um, it was just. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, I'd read about other tensions going on, but that there was this undercurrent of, of anger. Uh, it was, I was unprepared for it. And, but also at that same time, it was before the Intifada, and there was, no, there was no fence, and there was no even demarcation between uh, Israel and the West Bank. And I would drive around, and I wouldn't, I'd have to read signs to figure out whether I was in uh, a Palestinian village or an Israeli village. And so, and, and the access to uh, the Haram al-Sharif and the Dome of the Rock was completely open. And so, at, at that point, there was in fact less tension uh, what, what's bet between, the, between the Palestinians yes. and the Israelis. What kind of family did you grow up in? And Israel played no part in your childhood, you say, but to what extent? So that there is no real um, connection between coming from a Jewish family and photographing in Israel. Um, I would say that I... I was probably in a family where not unlike many others in New York at the time, where um, Judaism was more of a cultural thing than uh, a religious thing, where we would we would go uh, we, we would go to, to synagogue on the on the high holy days. Uh, almost all of my parents' friends were Jewish. We would. Um, it, it was, but. You know, occasional um, Yiddish words were used in the house, uh, but it, it was more cultural. But I think often in when in, in Jewish families that where Judaism has become more cultural than religious, especially in the United States, perhaps Israel takes a larger role because um, in, in some ways it replaces uh, religious feeling. As a, as a focus of loyalty. Yeah, it, 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 that, wasn't, it wasn't that, the case. That didn't happen in, 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 my, in my part of the family. Uh, I mean, I, as I've spent time there, the country has meant m more and more to me. Um, and I've looked back and tried to figure out what was going on in my family at the time. But I was young, and I didn't, it's hard. I'm not sure I have that many memories. But I, I think about what it's like, what it's like for a Western Jew in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust, and and what effect does this have? And um, does it make you want to proclaim your faith more, or do you want to keep your head down? And I think people have gone different ways.
and in your family environment, it wasn't there wasn't a question of keeping any heads down, presumably. I mean, no, but I, but there was also not. Um, there was not a strong clinging to the faith, although I, I went to a religious school every week. And what I found later in my life was that uh, as I re-experience different traditions, that the seeds of all these memories are all implanted, and that even the, the melodies used for certain prayers and, and uh, were, were kind of deeply burned in. So somehow, even though I, I wouldn't say my family was particularly religious, I was exposed enough so that there was this, this trace, of, more than a trace, a foundation that uh, I think was there to be reawakened. I suppose what I'm, I'm getting at is, is whether there is a, it, that names like Jerusalem, Hebron, uh, Tel Aviv, Haifa, and so on, um, in some ways have, had this, have the same almost mystical exoticism that Amarillo and Memphis and Nashville and so on had for us growing up with pop songs about it. I mean, was there, some, was there a resonance there that made you feel that it was compelling to photograph? Um, Amarillo always had more of a resonance. Than Hebron. <laughs> yes. Uh, but the first time I drove around, and I wasn't looking for those resonances, but, you know, I'd come to Jericho, and I think, oh my God, this is, here I am in Jericho, or Megiddo, you know, but and, and the country's so small that this, you know, you, you would come across many of these in a day of driving. Uh, and so I, I, I wasn't, as I said, looking for that resonance. I wasn't seeking it out because it meant, but, but the names were, are just in our culture. Carmel, you know, it's just, it's all over our culture. Well, it's all over America, too as is Carmel. Yes, yes. Um, probably Jericho, there's probably a Jericho, Texas somewhere. <laughs> um, so you wouldn't have probably do, do, photographed Israel in this manner if, if the project hadn't come to you? Or I wouldn't have, mm -hmm. and I'm just very glad. How did that, that happen? Uh, Frederick Brenner uh, approached me and asked if I would be interested, and um, it's not every point in, in a artist development when a project coming to them is coming at the right time. And uh, I just felt immediately that I needed to have some input from the outside rather than follow my own instincts. Sometimes it's very useful, again, coming back to your first question about problem solving, to have someone else propo propose the problem. Uh, can can uh, kind of shake some of the uh, mold off, and uh, I just immediately felt that this was right. Are there other places that you feel that you'd 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 love to go and and photograph of other countries, or would you like to go back to the kind of landscapes that you photographed in the 70s and 80s in the United States? To, uh, to sort of I, show I did. Change? I actually tried it last year. I did a cross-country trip, um, which was, I did a very short one, it was about a week and a half, and, but it was a, just tremendous fun, and I was struck by just how endlessly beautiful the American landscape is, and, and, and how varied it is. Um, but where would I want to go? The, the place that somehow is, sometimes I pick places that I've never been, and don't know really much about and don't know why I'm, I want to pick them, like uh, Scotland. Uh, and the place that is sort of in my mind is uh, Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Why Uzbekistan? 
I think the main thing is whenever I see pictures of old Islamic architecture there, it's just amazing. But as I've looked into it more, the, the well, also spending time in Ukraine and seeing the Soviet architecture, the, the, the contrast is striking. And I, and I don't know why. I, I, I would go to find out. Have you ever been there? I've never been to Uzbekistan. It's, it, the, the name is wonderful. I, well, and I, uh, I'm do, a great do you, believer are, in names. The, yeah. the, the, Tristan da Kunha, an island, it must be a great place. I mean, how can it fail with a name like that? In Uzbekistan, I feel... Are there places you want to go? Uh, yeah, Iran. I'd, I'd love to go. Um, but it's silly to say that and not go. I mean, it's, it, it, one should just go. Yeah. Uh, um, I think on that note, we're... Um, unless there's something more you'd like to... Well, there's one more question. You talk about the beauty of the American landscape when you went back. Your photographs are, are of the landscape are very compelling, but the ones that really stick in my mind are of the urban landscape in America, and not the, the great cities, but the sort of the sprawl around the provincial urban America. Mm -hmm. To what extent has that changed since you first started traveling? You know, on this trip that I did a year and a half ago, one of the things that struck me is how little things have changed. Uh, the strips have changed to some extent. Uh, when I was first photographing in the 70s, just when commercial strips started being developed, but they had already happened. Uh, the one thing that didn't happen was the big box store, and that's new. The other change is the quality of food. It, it, you cannot imagine how, how terrible, terrible the food was, was yeah. in the 70s, outside of a few cities. I mean, it was just unbelievably bad. And now I can get, you can get good meals just about everywhere. Yes, I think that's true. The uh, same is true in Britain, uh, perhaps even more so. But on that note, um, uh, I think we can conclude. <laughs>